Hello, I'm Brithala Shah, and this interview is part of a series from the Imperial War Museum Institute's Reimagining Victory series to mark the 75th anniversary of VE Day this year. It's made in partnership with the peacebuilding NGO Conciliation Resources. What we're hoping to do is try to investigate the connections between past conflict and our history, the world we live in now. And I'm joined today by Miriam Coronel Ferrer. She's a Filipino peace negotiator and the chairperson of the peace panel of the government of the Philippines from 2010 to 2016. She's the first female chief negotiator in the world to sign a final peace accord with a rebel group. And that was between the government of the Philippines and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front in 2014. Welcome very much, Miriam Coronel Ferrer. Just to begin to think about the big theme of these interviews, what does the word victory mean to you? Uh, victory, of course, can mean different things to different people. Uh, but at the end of the day, it has to be judged on the basis of um, how equitable the outcome of any process has been, how it has actually created that kind of a momentum to change um, the status quo so that um, you arrive at a society that's better and um, more inclusive of uh, the different segments of society. It's a long process. I think you'll never get to real victory, but it's that kind of being able to struggle hard for it and seeing the fruits of your struggle. Do you think it's an idea that has to be owned by all sides? Oh, uh, definitely. Um, it, it, but it's not that easy in any case. Um, in uh, political negotiations, for instance, there will always be people who believe that it doesn't make sense or it's not going to achieve what it's supposed to achieve. So that kind of uh, generating the public consensus is very important in every step of the process. So uh, to that extent, yes, it's very important uh, to get that kind of um, ownership of the process and of the outcome as well. And that can only happen if people feel that there's something in it for them. Indeed, any negotiation is trying to see how everybody can somehow benefit. Not everybody might be happy about it, but in uh, completely happy, but at the end of the day, it should create these positive changes. And that's the kind of difference that should be made. Well, you've had first-hand experience of really tough negotiations. You helped to lead negotiations with an Islamist group at the time when people just said, this isn't possible. What would you say was the, the biggest challenge and how did you tackle it? The biggest challenge, of course, had to do precisely with that kind of public consensus. And uh, the, uh, on the one hand, um, there was already good starting point. We believe that the more Islamic liberation front was serious about political negotiations. And then we had the president who also wanted to see through the process during his term. Um, uh, the MILF was projecting to, to the public that uh, for them, the most civilized way to settle this armed conflict, this longstanding uh, armed conflict that has affected two and two to three generations is through a political settlement and to their own public that they have communicated using Quranic um, injunctions like such as um, if your enemy is inclined to peace so be inclined and put your trust in Allah. So that solved the rest of the equation had to do now with the public, the politicians who are very much you know, uh, who get into the fray uh, on very short-term interest. And indeed, that was our, uh, our major battle, to win the public opinion and to win the politicians who will be important in passing the needed legislation. How difficult was it, though, to, inc to really encourage or persuade the Moro rebels to take part in regular politics? It took a long time. In fact, uh, there, there was uncertainty after all the negotiations took 17 years in all. It started in 1997, there was a ceasefire agreement. In three years later, this was reversed by the new president who came in. 
you've had several presidents coming since then, and there was that kind of inconsistency. So um, it was uh, difficult for them to really, really um, trust the government in the same way that government uh, personalities had different levels of trust. But once that was invested, then, uh, then uh, the, the, the elements were slowly put in place. When these were Islamic fighters, how difficult did they find it to engage with you as a woman negotiator? There was resistance in the beginning. Uh, they felt that uh, uh, having a woman as the, the, the head of the government panel would tie their hands uh, because uh, they felt that they will, cannot quarrel with women. And uh, of course, that wasn't true at all. Uh, and they would have to adjust all this time. Uh, they were an all-male panel and they had been negotiating with um, uh, panels that were led by men in government, although we, government always uh, eventually had other women in the team, but not as the government chair. So it's, it was all of this difficulty, but uh, through that kind of um, uh, seriousness of purpose, uh, the, the, the belief that uh, there, is, um, there is that kind of uh, commitment to see this process and also the, an understanding of the real issues that drove the conflict and the issues that needed now to be addressed in a political settlement, then that kind of trust um, was built among, across the genders and certainly across the, the parties. And what about including women in civil society, in civil-led groups, as you try to forge the future that might grow out of the peace? So it was very important, the kind of support that we get, got from women's organizations. What was going on in the negotiations had to be translated into that kind of um, mass support. And the women played a big role because they had invested in this. They, we told them that maybe we won't be able to uh, bring in all the important provisions that are in, necessary to really have a strong uh, gender responsive foundation. We did manage to get that, but uh, negotiations is only one step. And in, because they did not leave the process in the next step, they were very active as well in legislating a good law. And we saw that in the law that finally came out of the process, the law that will institute the autonomous governance in the Bangsamoro region in the south of the Philippines um, was able to put in even more gender responsive provisions. And we also have to thank the women legislators in Congress, both in the lower house and the upper house, because they work, work with um, the civil society organizations in ensuring that you put in more, more of these elements, very specific elements that will operationalize uh, the gender provisions in the agreement. There has been the imposition of martial law since that peace agreement was signed. It hasn't been an entirely straightforward process. How do you feel looking back on where Mindanao has arrived, where the peace agreement eventually led the area? Well, that's precise, that was precisely the problem. The negotiations was taking a long time. And in the meantime, you had fallouts from the more Islamic liberation front, the, uh, some commanders and some very young people getting um, attracted to the more radical ideologies. And indeed, they were, they were already present in our shores. We had the regional variant of uh, the ISIS, the Jema Islamiyah. There have been previous contacts with Al-Qaeda. More fighters fought in the war in Afghanistan. Um, uh, then, the, the attraction of uh, the, the new groups that have eventually emerged meant that the longer the negotiations took place, the longer the implementation happened, these spaces will be occupied by these violent extremist groups. And indeed, we saw that uh, two years ago, um, precisely the kind of fighting that we witnessed in one part of the Bangsamoro region, um, uh, manifested that kind of uh, real threat that the more moderate Islamic movements, uh, such as the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, uh, uh, might just lose out to the more radical elements unless, unless the reforms are significantly put in place. So that's the challenge that continues to be faced now. 
is that something that that frustrates you, disappoints you, looking back on something that clearly was very hard fought? It's never easy. I mean, negotiations isn't easy. Implementing is even more difficult as anybody who has been involved in this, in this process knows. Uh, there are a lot of delays. You're dealing with a government that is a bureaucracy. There are turnovers in, uh, in the people who govern. There might be different priorities. So you always have this problem of being able to deliver. And then for the MILF, because they are now the uh, transition authority, they're in fact government now. I am now the non-state actor and my colleague in the, in the negotiation from the other side is now the state actor. He's now the minister of education in the Bangsamore transition authority. There's a challenge of being able to uh, really transform themselves from being revolutionaries to people who are in government trying their best to institute the kind of moral leadership that they had been advocated. Then you have COVID-19 um, uh, sort of making things a little more, more difficult for Mr. Iqbal, who is the Minister of Education, uh, the problem of lack of facilities, um, basic facilities, not even uh, IT facilities has, uh, uh, has made the problem more uh, pronounced, especially now that you are going through uh, some kind of um, more reliance on uh, online teaching. So a lot of adjustments have to be made and that's a kind of challenge that they continue to face. So it's not about it being difficult. I mean, you take it for granted that these things are difficult, but what we're seeing is on some kind of a positive movement. Nothing is perfect, no parties, Parties are not perfect, agreements are not perfect, implementation can never be perfect. But what's important is you see that there's a kind of political will and there's a kind of support coming from all over, both domestically, nationally and internationally. You sort of answered this question, but I'll, uh, maybe there's something more to say. Um, do you feel optimistic then about the future, given the ups and downs that have occurred since the original negotiation? I'm a peace advocate and the peace advocate is always optimistic and the kind of um, uh, challenges that we're facing now can really provide new spaces for uh, more uh, sustained efforts. I mean, again, it's not easy and it doesn't come automatically, but certainly the optimism is there and that optimism has to be grounded on real action, real action that um, must um, must accompany the words, the rhetoric, uh, precisely because what you need are concrete results as well. Miriam Coronel Ferrer, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.